here. Thank you, Mike, for the water. One glass full, one jug full, used for drinking or for throwing. <laughs> so if you think it's a good chance to nod off, <laughs> you might have a second baptism. Once a teacher, always a teacher. I'm going to talk on eternal judgment and uh, I'll just give you initially a synopsis, five areas I'm going to touch upon and then I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to speak about. Bear with me. I'm going to talk about the in inevitability of eternal judgment, the desirability of eternal judgment, judgment for the believer, judgment for the unbeliever, and how to live in the light of eternal judgment. I'm not going to talk about God's judgments in this life. God judges people. God judges nations. That's not my subject. I'm not going to talk about what's going to happen to us when we leave our bodies, absent from our bodies, and we go home to the Lord. We know that's going to happen. We know we're going to see him, and when we see him, we'll be like him. But one problem with trying to understand eternity is that eternity does not have time, and we cannot understand things outside the context of time. I'll give you an example. I lose my loved one who goes to heaven, and I say, I'm still young. It might be many, many, many years before I'm reunited with that loved one. It won't seem that for the one who's gone ahead. It'll be like the twinkling of an eye because they don't live in time. Don't ask me to explain that because it's inexplicable. We're told we're going to exchange these our lowly bodies of humiliation for glorious resurrection bodies. And sometimes the longer we live, the more they are bodies of humiliation. You say, how long will I have to wait before I get my... They won't be waiting in heaven. So I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm going to talk about those areas that I mentioned. And I'm going to just read a scripture from Acts and chapter 17 and verse 31. And it says this, God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. God has set a day when he will, he will judge the world with justice and he has appointed a man. We're told in John 5.22, the Father has entrusted all judgment to the Son. So it will be the Son of God who does the judging. There was a pastor, and he was giving out invitations to a special gathering planned in his church. And he went to the houses, which were round about the church building. And on this particular door, when he rang on the doorbell, the young man who came to greet him and meet him, if you wanted a word to describe that young man, you might say, arrogant. When he realized what the pastor was about, he said, I'm not interested in that. I don't believe in any of that stuff. And I'm certainly not going to your church. Thank you. Thank you, but no thank you. So the pastor looked him in the eye and smiled and said, I do respect your opinions, 
But, he said, Scripture tells us it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that comes judgment. I bid you good day. And off he went. Three days later, there was a ring on the door of the pastor's house. And yes, you guessed it. The same young man. I need to talk to you. Those words that you, you, I've not got them out of my head, day and even night. Pointed unto men, was it once to die and after that comes judgment? I can't shake those words off. Well, of course, the Spirit of God will anoint and bring conviction through the Word of God more than through our words. Let's remember that. And if it's appointed unto men once to die, that means we can get, what's the word I'm looking for, and kick it into touch, reincarnation. There ain't such a thing. Once to die and after that comes judgment. And that young man gave his life to Jesus on that particular day. There is one thing which everybody alive is willing to concede and agree on, and that is that this life is going to end in death. We all know that that is true. But there's something equally sure that not everybody is able to realize, that after death, there's going to be a judgment. It's going to happen, God says so, and surely it will. It's just about as absurd to deny the second as to deny the first. Oh, I'm not sure whether we're going to die or not. It will happen. There are two sadnesses about the human condition, and one sadness, and it is a sadness, is that many, many people will struggle and stumble through the journey of life and they will never discover the sunshine of the love of Jesus for them. We have been spared that tragedy. They'll never realize that Jesus loves them, and they'll never know that in their struggles there was help, resources, strength, guidance available, and they never drew on it. They never lived life as life was designed to be lived. The second great sadness is this. Many people will live this life as if it is the only life, and it's not. That is a tragedy. The embryo is in a short stage of preparation in the mother's womb, being prepared for a life beyond its ability to understand because it's going to be in a totally different dimension and through birth into this life, which we know, which itself is a comparatively short period of preparation for another life, which again we can't begin to understand. Because it's not in the material world, it's in the spiritual world. And as I've said, it's not in time, it's in eternity. And we go through death to that life which lies beyond. Now, if you go to the caterpillar on the hedge and tell that caterpillar, it won't always be crawling on the hedge, but it's going to come a time when it will weave a chrysalis, a cocoon around itself, and then it's going to emerge from that cocoon and be another creature flying around, an object of beauty, able to look down on the hedge that it's crawling on at that time. The caterpillar probably will think you're crazy. But it's true. This life is but a preparation for the life that lies beyond. And after this life, as sure as the word of God is true, as sure as day follows night, there will be judgment. So we accept the inevitability of it. The next thing I want to talk about is its desirability. You say, how can eternal judgment be desirable? Some of us know Psalm 73, and in Psalm 73, the psalmist is having a hard time. He's quite embittered because he looks around, and the righteous people seem to be suffering, and the wicked people seem to be having a ball and living in clover. clover. And he says it's not fair. They're getting away with everything. But then, 
we're told in the psalm, he came into the sanctuary, that's the house of God, it's here when God will help us to see things in right perspective. And he'll speak to us the truth from his word. And in that place, suddenly the psalmist realized he saw the end of the wicked. And then he thanked God from the depth of his being that he'd been spared from that fate. And so grateful he was to know God as the alternative. There's a verse in Ecclesiastes, and it's chapter 8, verse 11. It says this. Because sentence against an evil deed is not speedily executed, the hearts of the sons of men are fully set to do evil. Because sentence against an evil deed is not speedily executed, I am seen to do something wrong, I know it's wrong, and, and nothing happens. The ceiling doesn't fall on my head. <sighs> Maybe there isn't a God, or maybe he doesn't mind. Or and we have the sense we've got away with it. So we go and do it again and do it again. Because sentence against an evil deed is not speedily executed, the hearts of the sons of men are fully set to do evil. We live in the delusion there's no accountability. We've got to think when they think about judgment, what would be the alternative in living in a world where there was no judgment? What would society be like if there was no accountability, when everybody could do whatever they like, no punishment, no retribution? What would a school be like? Maybe some people have been in a school like that. It's not much fun to be in it. That is the alternative if you have no judgment. The good news, and it is good news, is that God will bring judgment, and the second piece of good news is that God will do it justly. He will do it fairly. There'll be no mistakes. Abraham said this, Genesis 18.25, will not the judge of all the earth do right? And the judge of all the earth will do right, we can be totally convinced of that. When Millie, who's known by many of us, a missionary in our church, she's 96 in about two weeks' time, she went out to, from Mills Cobb School to teach in northwest Zambia, and she actually went out to take over from a senior missionary called Hilda Kelly. Hilda Kelly was a redoubtable lady, came from Merseyside, she was 80, and she was running a small Christian bookshop and doing the scripture lessons in the newly established secondary school where I was a teacher. And Millie came over to take over from her. We persuaded Millie, incidentally, to teach science as well as religious knowledge because she had a much better impact on the school as a teacher, and she did it very well. Now, we did all our lessons in the morning because it got hot in the afternoon, 20 past 7 till 10 to 1, school day over. But sometimes I used to go down and help Hilda Kelly in her Christian bookshop. You say, what help were you? Well, I painted a few shelves. Don't smile like that. Okay, I was a pest. <laughs> Looking back, this lady who'd been a missionary for about 150 years, she... She was very wise because she knew I wasn't a Christian and she didn't try to convert me. I'm sure she prayed for me. And occasionally I'd ask her a question. I remember once asking her, it was a very sad story, this Christian teenage lad, he'd fallen from a tree, he'd damaged his brain, he was never the same again afterwards. In his mid-twenties, either he jumped or fell from a fast-moving train and he was killed. And I said, Hilda... Will he go to heaven if he took his own life? I know now, of course, he will, but I didn't know then. And Hilda said, all you need to know, John, is that God is just. So she answered that question and the next thousand I had on similar questions. That's all we need to know, that God is judge, but God is just. God has never made a mistake. God never will make a mistake. God cannot make a mistake. 
And so that's good news on both occasions. Next, I want to look at this question, judgment for the believer. If we know Jesus, and I believe we do, we've been forgiven, we know we get to heaven by being forgiven, not by being good. Is that good news, Joy? That's good news for me. We get to heaven not by being good, but by being forgiven, because we have to be humble enough to ask for that forgiveness. And the good news for us is, at the judgment seat of God, we read about it in Revelation, we will not stand before the great white throne as guilty people. We won't be there because we have already been acquitted. That's good news, because it's going to happen, folks, and the Bible tells us, and it is totally sure. Our names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That happened when we gave our lives to Jesus. The reason we're not going to stand guilty at that day is because the judgment which we deserved has already fallen. It's already taken place. And you know why? Because Jesus took that judgment, he took that condemnation, he took our punishment on himself. If you can understand it, our sin has already been punished, so God can forgive us and stay just, because God has to punish sin. Some people think God's got a blind eye and turns a blind eye to sin. I tell you, he ain't got a blind eye. He knows it, and he's got to punish it. Jesus took our punishment on himself. This week we've had hot weather and quite a lot of wildfires in Europe. France has suffered a lot. And I would just say this, the wildfires in Europe are nothing compared to the bushfires you might expect to see in Australia or America or Africa. If you're in Africa and there's a bushfire, the first thing you'll see, probably at a distance, is smoke and lots of it. You'll find the wind is intensifying in its strength and there are lots of little bits and smuts and cinders which get in your eye. And if you have no means of escape, a motorized vehicle or a helicopter, you need to know that that fire, and soon the smoke is getting nearer and bigger and even going to blot out the sun, that fire is coming to you faster than a galloping horse. It's moving, folks. And if you go up an anthill or find a place of vantage, you'll see the flames spread across the whole horizon. And then you'll hear the fire raging as it approaches. And you have no means of escape. But there is one way to escape. Light your own fire. Do you understand? I light a fire and let it be spread windward ahead of me. So I've got this huge fire approaching me, but I've lit my own fire, and that fire will prepare for me a burnt, barren patch of ground that the main fire will not be able to touch. The ashes will cool, hopefully a little bit, before I have to, and the heat is so intense I have to move, and then I can go and take shelter on the patch which is already burnt. We are going to be spared the fire of God's judgment because we are standing on the ground where the fire has already fallen. Does that make sense? And that is a place called Calvary. So for eternal judgment, it's not something we are fearful of. We're justified. Justified just as if we'd never sinned. That's amazing. God sees you, Joy, just as though you'd never sinned. Eh? Is that good news? I don't, but she does. <laughs> or if you like, we're justified just as if we'd died. And if you hear Sarah Greenwood's very good thought for the day yesterday, she will explain that. We are standing justified 
we know we are forgiven. We do have an enemy, and he does whisper in our ears. I don't know if an enemy ever whispers in your ears and makes us feel guilty. He's called the father of lies. He's also called the accuser of the brethren. And he seeks to bring to mind failures of the past, past sins, past mistakes, and he seeks to condemn us. But Judas then at that point turned to Romans chapter 8 verse 1 and it says this, there is now no condemnation for those who are found in Christ Jesus. We are forgiven, there is no condemnation. It's been taken from us. And we have nothing to fear in the knowledge that God one day is going to judge the whole world. But there is a judgment seat where we're going to appear. This is not bad news. There's another judgment seat, not the great white throne. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. We must all, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, where each of us, Romans 14.22, will give an account of himself or herself to God. We're all going to stand before God and we're going to face a judgment. But what's going to be judged is our life work. It's not a place of punishment. Now, my good esteemed friend, Mr. Nuku there, on Tuesday, he had his graduation. It was the hottest day ever recorded and he had to be scrubbed up. If you don't believe it, I've seen the photograph. He must have borrowed a tie because he was wearing one. And he had his suit on, and he had his gown on, and he had his mortarboard on. Okay? All the students who had passed their exams, they all attended the graduation. Everyone received a reward. Do you understand? It was a reward ceremony, not a punishment ceremony. If he hadn't passed his exam, he wouldn't have been there and his family came all the way down to Scotland where they wasted their journey. But there were different degrees of degree. There were different classes of degree. And on that day at the judgment seat of Christ, there'll be different degrees of reward given. Now, my friend Nuku, hold your breath, first class honours degree. <laughs> When I heard that, I felt so intellectually intimidated. I didn't even know whether he'd speak to me again, whether I should kneel down when he was speaking to me. I didn't know that, but he was very condescending. There are going to be rewards given on that judgment seat of Christ's day, and everyone is going to appear but we've all passed, if you like, to one degree or another. I was asked to see a man once in Southport Hospice. He was dying. He was a Christian believer, and he was terrified. Would you go and see him? I'll tell you why he was terrified. He was a married man, and he'd lived with another woman for the last years of his life. And he knew that any day now, he was going to meet his maker, and he was terrified. And I felt that God draw my attention to scriptures to be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and it talks about the fact that our lives as Christians are built on the foundation of Jesus, okay? Okay? over me that far. And then it says this. This is what I read to him. I said, if any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burnt up, he will suffer loss. 
he himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. You know how we test precious metal? We put it in the furnace, and if it's a genuine article, it will come out. The dross will be burnt away. Our lives are going to be tested, as it were, by fire. If, for instance, I've been engaged in Christian work for most of my life, but my motivation is basically to build my own kingdom and I'm self-interested and I want to promote myself and, and do better than other people, all that work's going to be burnt up in flames. Wrong motive, you understand that? If I do it in love for God and love for service for other people, I will receive a reward. And God will reveal on that day. If incidentally I am in a place of leadership and I make myself in a place of indispensability so everybody has to rely upon me and when I leave the work collapses like a pack of cards, I have been building with straw and hay and stubble and wood. It will all be burnt up. So we need to examine our motives for what we're doing because that will be crucial on that day of the judgment seat of Christ. And God will take into other things into consideration our privileges. From those who have received much, much will be expected. The gifts God has given us, the opportunities God has given us, all these things will be in the melting pot to decide the reward which God wants to give us. And the reward of our faithfulness, don't forget, well done, good and success, no, no, well done, good and faithful servant, says Jesus. The reward of our faithfulness in this life will be responsibility and opportunity and authority in the next life. How are we going to be rewarded? You don't think when we go to glory we're just going to sit with a harp and a halo. We won't. We'll still be worshipping God and we'll still have opportunity to serve God. Don't ask me what and how, I don't know. But Scripture makes that quite plain. And the degree which we are entrusted to serve will be dependent on the life we have lived and the work of this life. So we do escape the eternal judgment of God but we do have to sit in the judgment seat of Christ. Now comes the difficult part of this talk. What about, you say, John, judgment for the unbeliever? What about judgment for the one who dies in their sin? Jesus talks about that in John and chapter 8, those who die in their sin. What happens to those people? And what happens to the people who reject Jesus in this life and don't want to know? And their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The simple truth is that God will reject them. But there are two provisos, which I think we need to bear in mind. The first is this. None of us know the state of a person when they pass from this life to the next. We don't know because only God knows their heart. It is possible, and I'm sure there's evidence to prove it, that people reach to God in the last part of their life. I heard about somebody this week, and I was staying with this lady in Yorkshire, near Grassington, and she had an uncle who was a godless man. And he had lung cancer and he was dying. And Mary was a nurse and they said, will you go and sit next to your uncle? And she did. And he woke up, and I've heard it before, he suddenly had a time of consciousness and lucidity. Oh, Mary, he said. And then he said this. He said, Mary, I've asked God to forgive me and he's forgiven me and then into unconsciousness, and God took him. We don't know. 
Julia Hare had two brothers, no sisters, and sadly both brothers were drowned, different years, different continents. And I remember when Derek, the first one, the younger brand, was drowned, we got the message, I was teaching at Scaresbury Hall, and he was dry, dry, drowned off the coast of New Guinea. We weren't looking for consolation, but God clearly showed us in the next days and weeks that when Derek died, he was right with God and ready to meet him. Well, you say, how could that be? I know he knew the message of the gospel. He stayed with us the year before, and we took him for a day at Keswick, which was pretty powerful for a poor man. And we can only believe that in his dying moments, he cried to God. I wasn't going to say this one, but I heard two. In fact, this story was told to us about the time when we were grieving the loss of Derek, a young man who decided tragically to take his own life. It was the depth of winter. He had a high-powered motorbike. He was going to rev it up, get top speed, and there was a kind of bridge across the road, and he was going to just steer off the side of the road and hit the parapet and end if he'd had enough of life. But it was winter. There'd been a lot of snow, and when he caught the curb just before going off the road, it clicked the back. You're a motorcyclist, you can understand that. And up he flew into the air, and he landed in a snowdrift, alive, and in mid-air, he cried to God for forgiveness, and he landed with a saving faith. We don't know, folks. We don't have to despair. We know God is just, and there are those who will cry to God when they have no other source of help. The other thing you say, and it's a fair question, and you'll be asked this question, and it's good to have an answer. What about the people who've never heard the name of Jesus? How can they reject the Jesus they've never heard of? What about people in Old Testament times? What about people who live in the jungle of Borneo? Well, if you read the first chapters of Romans, you'll find that God says there are two witnesses he's given to every human life. One is the witness of creation. Creation displays God, if we've got eyes to see. We can see there's a creator behind, and second gift he's given to us is a gift of conscience. And everyone has a conscience to know what's right or wrong. Now, it is true living, we can see that conscience, so it's no longer sensitive but it's there. Now, you know Harry and Bonnie, they've got three delightful, angelic little children. Nod your head, Harry, at the back. He doesn't look convinced. And uh, if you watch the children playing, before, and they play down there, before one pinches a toy or a property from the other one, brother or sister, they might just glance to see if the parents are watching. Or if they're not going to pinch something, they're actually going to pinch the brother or sister, they will also look. We have built into us a conscience which tells us right or wrong. And the Word of God would tell us that if we live according to our conscience, according to the light we have, I'll give you chapter and verse afterwards if you need convincing, we will be judged on that. And we will be accepted by God because we've lived according to the light we've had not because we, our good works have won us a place, because Jesus, who took the punishment for all, including people in that category. But what about those people who are going to hear the words, depart from me, for I never knew you. The Bible does not mince its words. The universalist who believes everyone will be saved because God is love is just in desperate error. Read the teachings of Jesus. The word is banishment, and it's a very sound, serious word. Never-ending punishment, Jesus suggested. Separated from God, separated from the presence of God, separated from the love of God, separated from the mercy of God, separated from the hope of salvation. Jesus told the story, do you remember, the rich man and the beggar who sat at his gate called Lazarus, and they both ended up the other side of death in different places, one with God and one not because one was rich, but because of the way of their lives. 
And the Bible tells us a great chasm was to be found between the two. It was impossible for them to exchange, to go from one place to another. Ecclesiastes 11 and 2, it says this, whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, the place where it falls, it will lie. When the tree falls, where it falls, it will stay. And our state of our soul, when we leave this life, whatever that state is at that moment, that will be the state it continues in. And these are very sobering words. I want to tell you I did not choose to do this subject. It was given to me. Because it's a hard subject to speak on. And uh, to think that we can be separated from God for eternity. Jesus said there will be degrees of torment. He said it's better if you are born in Sodom than in Capernaum because in Capernaum the light of God has come. They will suffer even more. And uh, I don't see hell as a place. I see it as a reality. But hell is being without God in eternity and heaven is being with God. Does that make sense? If we have God in this life, we'll have God in the next life. So inevitability of judgment, the desirability, it's good there is a judge and things will be made right and justly so. Judgment for the believer, nothing to fear apart from maybe losing our reward. But we will lose our reward, we will not lose our salvation. My friend in the hospice, do you understand me? I made it plain to him, he will perhaps lose his reward, but he will not lose his salvation. All will be saved, even perhaps as though picked up and rescued from the fire. That's good news. Our salvation is sure. Nothing will separate us from the love of God, which we thought of. Living in the light of this judgment. Well, I do believe, one, it's very quick, this last section, we need to live in the fear of God. The fear of God is not a craven fear. It's a reverence. We are fearful of disobeying God. There will be consequences. We are fearful of disappointing God. We are fearful of missing the opportunity which God gives us as gifts. We are fearful of missing God's best. That's not something which terrorizes us. It just helps us to motivate us in life. Then the second implication is if there's one grateful people on the face of the earth today, it's in this building and in other buildings like it. The more we experience the goodness of God and the more we realize where we were and where we could be today and where we were heading if it hadn't been for Jesus, the more grateful we are. And so one of the, con one of the attributes, the qualities of Christians, and I believe it increases with age, Gene will probably concur with this, the older we grow, the more thankful we are. We thank God over and over. We thank God for the things once we took for granted. Every blessing we're thanking God for. And Gene, we can't do what we did perhaps at one stage, but we're grateful for the time to when we could, and we're grateful for what we can still do. All the time, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So we live in the fear of God. We live with thankful hearts and thankful spirits. And then the third thing, and the last thing is this. We live with God ever seeking to build bridges into other people's lives so that we can tell them about a saviour called Jesus. It's not often I meet somebody on the street and I have the opportunity to preach the gospel, but I can get to know this one, I can talk to that one, I can listen to that one. We're part of God's cosmic rescue operation, if we can see it. Anybody here with me, they can remember the people who... who demonstrated they had something in their lives which I didn't have, who loved me, who prayed for me, and told me about Jesus. Anyone got people like that looking back? And you'll be grateful for those people for all of time and all of eternity. But God can be grateful, people can be grateful for us for the same reason. Our mission is to go into the world because we believe the things which we're talking about today, because we don't think judgment is a myth, we know how high the stakes are. We know how much there is to win or lose. And we will take every opportunity 
as an imperative with an urgency, not chasing our tail. I need to build a bridge to that life so that I can take words across the bridge strong enough to hold my words and convince them of the reality of God in this life.